Love the British monarchy? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the To Die For Daily podcast with Kinsey Schofield. Take it away, Kinsey. Hi, guys. Kinsey here with the To Die For Daily podcast. And today I'm talking to royal commentator and talk TV correspondent, Rupert Bell. Now, um, Rupert, you've been referred to as the poshest man on talk sports. And you received a Journalist of the Year Award from the British Equestrian Federation. So you're kind of a big deal is what I'm trying to say. How does one mix sports and royalty? At first, it kind of sounds like they, it doesn't make sense, but in all honesty, it makes a lot of sense. Well, it, it, it was a quirk of fate. I, as you say, I work for Talk Sport. And um, yes, I, I tend to what they cover is posh sports, which would be <laughs> horse racing, golf, tennis. Now, I'm a big football stroke soccer fan. Don't worry about that. I'm an Aston Villa season ticket holder, but I'm supposed to, I'm known as covering posh sports. Now, when it came to William and um, Kate's wedding back in 2011, uh, they said, well, we better make some reference to it. And so who can we get to do it? (laughs) And bizarrely, so they asked me, but I wasn't at Westminster Abbey or wherever that I can't remember. Was it Westminster Abbey? They got married. I think it was. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I happened to be covering the FEI World Cup indoor finals from Leipzig, Germany. (gasps) Wow. So I watched the wedding doing the odd update uh, from my uh, from a press room in Germany watching German TV. But luckily, I got two bits of information right, which was that Pippa Middleton sort of upstaged her sister. for, And um, as we know, in the, the famous bridesmaids dress oh, yeah. and uh, oh. David Beckham uh, was wearing his medals on the wrong side. Um, so uh, and from then on. Uh, it just evolved. Um, look, I, I presumably they thought what I said made sense. To not only talk sport, then talk radio came along, and it's just sort of well, it's grown exponentially. And actually, I've been doing more royal stuff now because um, not only with the sadness of the death of the Queen, but then obviously the coronation, but then that, that uh, Californian based on family are the family that keep on giving. So uh, whether you <laughs> agree with them or not, uh, they permanently seem to be in the news. So of which um, whatever side you come from, people are intrigued as to um, what they're up to next. That's absolutely true. And speaking of the California couple, you know, I read today that the judge in the mirror case was kind of taken aback that Harry didn't even bother to show up, that um, his his uh, representative said that he couldn't make it because of Lily's birthday. Uh, Will that I don't I don't know the law over there. Will do you think that negatively affects the case going forward that Harry didn't even bother to be there on day one? Uh, I don't know. I don't think it helps. That's for sure. Right. Um, the, the his his counsel, his lawyer is quite a showman, David oh. Sherburn. Uh, he's had a history of high profile, and he loves to rile judges. Uh, um, that's his. That's his um, sort of almost raison d'etre. And uh, look, H- Harry flew back from California today. He was due to come in if the opening addresses had short, and he would have come forward. But it, it clearly with Harry, it's going to be an interesting experience because, you know, we haven't had a member of the royal family appearing in court. Princess Anne did for speeding offences. <laughs> Edward VII, he appeared in 1870 in a court case over some sort of uh, alleged infidelity that he was up to, but didn't win it. And then actually was involved in a court case that involved uh, my great grandfather's, uh, my great grandmother's father in a place called Tramby Court. Uh, back in um, heart in in the 1890s, and King, it was over a card game. If you oh. look at this uh, Royal Baccarat scandal, so that was the last time Edward the Seventh, he wasn't king at the time, appeared in the court. But uh, as I say, my great grandmother, it was her father. It was at her house that this scandal took place over a uh, card gaming. Because if you if you cheated at cards back in then, it was an absolute no no. Oh. So, uh, but anyway, that was the last time. Uh, a, a king as uh, or a member of the royal family. Very, it's very rare um, that they would appear in court. So what Harry's did we, did, doing? Did, is did your family come out unscathed? Uh, 
Yeah, well, yeah, yes, they did. It was. It wasn't. None member of my family wasn't alleged to have cheating. It was a Scots Guards officer whose name just eludes me. Yeah. Um, but it was a uh, quite a case at, at the time, and uh, Edward the Seventh didn't. He was at the stage the Prince of Wales, and uh, he didn't come out of it completely with all uh, honor. Even then, you know, when there was a very reverential press, there was a feeling in the public opinion that you know it was sort of the guy was the sort of innocent victim in all this. Um, but it's quite an interesting case, and you can can read all about it on the famous internet. And uh, as I say, it was at my uh, great-grandmother's father's house. I can't, I, I've lost the will to count the number of greats, that is. But right. it, it, it was in, in, in Yorkshire, where they lived at a place called Tramby Croft, which is no longer in the family. Uh, but it was a guy called Arthur Wilson. Um, but he... he um, uh anyway the house has now been sold and it's a girls school in in northern england so there you go you didn't anyway that's uh, a connection and that probably uh gives you some reason why people probably think i might know what i'm talking about but it doesn't necessarily mean um i i you know i i have certain friends but um that's anyway we we digress from what we were talking about which was harry and harry um clearly um uh, He's he's in the spotlight here, and it will be very difficult for him. And, and presumably, the defense counsel will be after him, and will mm. be hoping he can trip up. That's you know that's what they will do, and they know. And that's one of the reasons they've said they wanted him to appear today because they felt they weren't going to get enough time to go through all the thirty three uh, alleged cases. Um, so it, it will be very interesting to see how he fronts up. What information comes out is already coming out that. You know, part of the breakdown of William and Harry came back in 2003 over uh, discussions about Burrell, uh, Diana's former uh, butler, uh, and sort of maybe briefing the press. So it's all we're going to hear lots of sort of details, probably of the the family, and and maybe Harry's case will centre around perhaps the members of. The other members of the royal family were briefing against him. And th so this is going to be, it might be uncomfortable um, listening and viewing for members, other members of the royal family, because clearly Harry, as we've seen, is not frightened of um, going, you know, hock deep into right. um, discussing it. Well, you know, you mentioned that, you know, the mirror's legal eagle, Andrew Green, uh, the Daily Beast here in the States, just to, to your point, said this could be a very dirty trial and it could get dirty very fast. And earlier, because this they're saying this is going to be seven weeks, we're about halfway in. He did bring up Harry's drug use and he did accuse Harry of providing um, fabricated evidence. So, you know, I think that a lot of people are going to be glued to this. And and unlike America, we just have to kind of wait till the end of the day to get a recap almost because in America, they, they live stream them. They become soap operas. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of interesting to have to have that patience to wait. Uh, I want to jump back more into your history, if you don't mind. You just told me your family had such a big home. It's now a, a, a school for girls. That's amazing. Uh, how beautiful that must be. I'd love to see that. Um, can I ask you the craziest or most interesting character you've met on the Royal beat? You know, is it a lady Colin Campbell? Um, I, I like, I can't remember his yeah. name, but there was somebody that they called the tomato James. One of the, one of the other reporters. Oh, James Whitaker. Yeah. James Whitaker. Well, like I, I did know James Whitaker because his son is an eminent racing photographer. And obviously I cover a lot of horse racing. Right. I have to explain. I, the, my royal beat is very different from not like the journalists and the correspondents. I've never been part of. I suppose I'm more a commentator. So I I don't go on the royal tours. So for me to say what I've done, my royal experience is, 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 is a very different one to what a lot of the other um, royal correspondents were done because they will probably go on the tours. So I haven't. I did know James Whitaker because he used to write a diary column for the Daily Mirror back in the day, and he was a larger-than-life character. And there used to be quite a, you know, gossip columns. There was a guy called Nigel Dempster who, in the Daily Mail, and they would always be looking for a, an exclusive bit of sort of 
aristocratic tittle tattle or showbiz tittle tattle. Uh, and they and it was and it was a William Hickey column in the Daily Express. So we used to have this group of people whose job was to be a, a gossip columnist, which probably meant they had the biggest flipping expense account anyone could imagine. In the days when that's what you did, you had a very long lunch and hoped whoever you taking up for lunch would eventually lose the will to live and start spilling the beans. Uh, old school style. Um, I, I mean, I from per, back when I started in the in the uh, early 80s as a, a sports journalist um, a news journalist i mean how i got uh, work was to go to the pub and just sort of hang around until someone said oh we need someone to go and do this and that's how you got work so um, and i'm not trained i've never yeah. been formally trained because i i started out in the army in the in the grenadier guards which is one of the household division regiments uh, the first regiment of uh, Grenadier Guards. Actually, if you remember at the funeral, the coffin bearers were Queen's Company Grenadier Guards. And actually, uh, the officer in charge was a it was a son of one of my fellow officers uh, in the Grenadier Guards. So the Grenadier Guards were at the heart of that. And that was a an interesting, you know, they'd been serving in Iraq the week before those guys. Um, and they were pulled literally off their duties in Iraq and told to get on a plane and then pla practice like Billio, carry so before they can start, um, you know, to what it was like to carry the the Queen's coffin, and they'd have mock ups and everything to to get it right. And they were my former regiment were brilliant. But I'm digressing. So um, anyway, no, I uh, love these I stories. Can't, I'm on a slightly different, um, I suppose, beat the way I've come to it, because as you say, I started out as a sports journalist and and a broadcaster, and as a result. The royal thing, I've stumbled into it, but clearly, um, talk TV, um, think I can, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you do. Um, no, uh, absolutely. Uh, no, I, I think that it's so interesting how, how entwined you are in this. And, um, you know, I saw somebody being being critical of us on uh, under the comment section never read comments about yourself um but i saw somebody being critical of us under the comment section of a jeremy kyle video and everybody was like rupert knows these people i trust what he's saying rupert's the guy so i do you have an incredible um reputation i don't care that you weren't on the on the royal road up because it's my understanding that it's super difficult to get in that circle and so i just assume that it, you know, it. I'm, I'm probably never going to, I'll probably never be in it. Well, it's a very limited, well, because obviously it's controlled by the palace and there will be certain organisations only, uh, British press, uh, that would be allowed to go and on TV outlets when they go on tours. And there is a sort of royal protocol, but, you know, it, it's not something I'm, I'm remotely interested in doing. Um, right. It's not, I, I, it's not, there are, younger and hungrier people who probably would want to do it um i i would rather be i like going to sports events i'm at the derby I, i'm going to roll while ascot which obviously the two collide um and then i'll go to wimbledon then i'll go to the open golf but at the same time i will have to keep a watching brief so i know that talk tv um may want some reaction um I don't do it for anybody else. Um, I'm not particularly interested in, in doing that. So um, because I think I'm busy enough as it is. I know you are. You're very busy. Um, I This is a stupid question because I know the answer to it. But have you ever met any royals? I know you went to school with Andrew. Um, can you tell me any stories about interacting uh, with the royal family? Uh, well, I shared a goddaughter with Princess Di. Um, so, um, you know. And did you meet? I, did I, you meet Diana? Well, obviously, because I was at the christening, and yes, I did. So, um, um, was she I, the most beautiful human being in the world? I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Okay. Um, she knew how to control the press. Yeah. She was she was very clever, but she well, had every right to feel a victim because it was okay. a very complicated time then. And you know, she was. If you think about it, I mean, she was 19 when she got married to a 31 year old. And it was a very different time. And she was hopelessly in love with him. Yeah. You know, swept off her feet, the sort of, you know, princess, um, you know, and, and it was a different time. And obviously, you know, you probably think that eventually 
sadly, the marriage broke down. Then Charles rekindled his relationship with the now Queen. But it was a complicated, and it, I think we, over time, absolute tragedy what happened. But you have to realise she was also very good at making sure she, and she was a stun, as you quite and we can see, she was a stunningly beautiful lady. But let's not be absolutely blinded by the, that, that she didn't know how to control the narrative. You know, you think when she turned up in that famous black dress, I mean, there was, you know, a wow factor. And it was like, he's doing the interview that went out on television at the time. And look, I'm, it was almost like, look what you're missing thing. Right. And she knew what to, to do. And in that absolute tragedy. And, you know, obviously her life taken too young, but she got herself into uh, circumstances. Uh, and clearly the media, if you think now, the trial that's going on now, is all part of the sort of fallout from that and the way the British press were operating. And so Diana was at the centre of it, and it was a tough old time. And yet, um, you know, so it's, it's, it, it was, it was uh, interesting, to say the least. But as I say, um, I know that she did a lot of good work for a lot of people because she did, when she went somewhere, there's no doubt she had... St- an X factor about her and she, the camera absolutely adored her. She was a, a fashion icon um, very much, you know, but the pressures on the subsequent generations to try and live up to that image. And I do feel for both at times for both Kate and Megan, because the press can be brutal because as soon as one of them is seen to have an ounce of being overweight, then look what's happening, you know, and you think, no, Leave right. them, you know, yes, but so there's pressure that they, they are under. Both any of the younger royals are always pressured to look as if they're still, you know, got got Hollywood glamour. And, and it's it's tough on them. But Diana definitely was a, you know, she photographed brilliantly, uh, knew how knew how to use the camera to a very good effect. So um, and, and then, as I say, I, I went to school with Andrew um uh, um, Prince Edward and very many, uh, this is prep school, this is school from 8 to 13, we only had 90 there um, and um, in a way it was um, I did write to my father once and said how do I become a duke because uh, <laughs> he, he used to have to write a letter on a Sunday and I said dad how do I become a duke because I seem to be the only one who wasn't a mem- hadn't got an aristocratic title but anyway there we go so but, cute uh, that is so cute I do want to go back really quickly to Diana you said that she knew how to work the press do you feel that Harry and Meghan I think Harry and Meghan think they know how to work the press but I don't think that they're as skilled as they think they are do you agree uh, I think the issue with them is they want to control the narrative and they they want that sort of holly you know the, back in the day you know, someone will go on a chat show and they may have nothing to promote. They just went on and did it. Now, as we know, if someone's going to appear to someone, they almost want to know what are the questions and you can't deviate. Right. They want to have the same kind of control. They basically want to control the narrative at all times. And yet, you know, at the time, they want their narrative narrative to be controlled around their status, which is as the Duke of Sussex, the Duchess of Sussex, with their two, the prince and princess as their children. The problem is they want all the trimmings of the royalty without the trappings of basically going out and doing stuff. And that doesn't sit well because, unfortunately, being in the royal family is about service and yes, you may be sent opening and endlessly cutting ribbons or pulling back a curtain for open up a plaque, but you are expected, you know, it is a charity. You're, you're there to do good work. So they want both, you know, which is where I think in terms of the British public, it sits uncomfortably because, you know, you, you can't have your cake and eat it. And, Look, you're in Tinseltown and you know all those actors and actresses want everything their PR managed with an inch of its life. They're paying PR people great sums of money to manage their image. But 
if uh, and so what we but in a way in Hollywood that's always be if you go through the years it was managed you know someone if they weren't going out with somebody suddenly they'd have a walker for the evening or you know you you'd have to create some story so it's not new but it was much it was sort of understood but actually the stars had the self confidence to just go out and behave but now no one because their image is everything and for Megan and Harry they want everything to be perfect well as we saw w- recently in New York the issue was um compounded if if nothing had happened after she'd got that award all the focus would have been on the award whether you agree or not that she deserved the award that's yes. irrelevant she right. got that award but instead and if I was the organizer of that award I would now be spitting feathers because the narrative went completely the other way and we spent all the time talking about a near catastrophic car crash now we don't know the exact details of what went on but clearly if the police and the taxi driver are anything to be believed by and they seem to be they hadn't got an agenda here not yeah. much happened but it right. distracted so therefore they're not they're making mistakes along the way so and, and that's their problem they're making too many mistakes and as a result their pr is in a mess at the moment it almost um, feels I, like... I really do think that particularly in this country that their pr is not where it wants to be because we've got that um we're fed up with basically hearing a whinge fest. Yeah. Because there's nothing worse than millionaires whinging. Oh, that's so true. But I almost wonder if Megan's had that hard time transitioning because when she was an actress making a significant amount of money but was not a household name, it was so much easier for her to control the narrative because she was just sending press information about herself. And she was a hustler. She did a lot of this stuff on her own. And they didn't do their due diligence. They were just like, okay, she says she's from here and she says she's had lived this life. And they would you know, publish it on their website or whatever. And now she's actually under scrutiny because she's so famous and it's so impossible to control because she, you know, she is just she ha- is a household name and she wasn't before. It was just so much easier to con- to keep everything controlled. I, 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 well, I mean, suits, I didn't even know existed, you know, and, and yet she did it for a long time and earned a lot of money. So presumably it was a re- it, it was a successful series. And I, I do know some people who said it and enjoyed it. Now, it was probably a bit of, you know, it was froth, basically. It was a series, a bit of bit of sort of slightly more serious froth, um, but well paid for quite a long time. But clearly she was an ambitious, hungry young lady and she was am- ambitious and we saw that. We But her, now, with everything being under scrutiny, you know, her, any flaws in what she says will be exposed. Now, clearly it is... So, you know, clearly the the family, her family is a dysfunctional one. Amen. But at one stage, her father did appear to be absolutely committed to look after her. But the narrative now has changed. And clearly he's an ill man. And I don't think at times the Markles also help themselves because they also look as if they're a bit money grubbing at times. Or one or two members may be looking as if they're trying to cash in. So... It, it won't be easy for her. But what the sad thing is, is that you've ended up with now them in the middle, but either side of it, no family wants to talk to them. So they are actually a bit cut off. Now, of course, it will be the odd family member who will be talking to in Megan's case. It's her mother, maybe Eugenie and Beatrice, maybe, mm. but there aren't many. Yeah, um, Zara. Who, who want to talk to uh, Harry and Megan because they... They don't trust them. Right. And that may be vice versa. So there is a common thread there. And you've got to look at, well, why has this happened? And, you know, they they blame everybody else. But sometimes you've got to look in the mirror. That is so true. Um, I know I promised you 20 minutes. I have a few more questions. Do you mind if I if I if I hammer no, you with a few on. more? OK, thank you, sir. I'm going to go back to school with Edward and Andrew. You got stuck on a ladder on sports day. Can you relive this story to me? The queen uh, is there. Like we've... what is going through your mind? 
And now a word from our sponsor. I, I used to hate sports day. I may be a sports journalist, but and I was quite a rotund young ba- ch- ba- child. And we had a thing called a fancy an obstacle course. Now there was a tapered ladder. So it was a there was a thick end and a thin end. And I saw every no one going to the thin end. I thought, well, I can steal a march. Well, I actually managed to get stuck in the thin end. And I looked to my right, and there I see the Queen howling with laughter because she was at the sports day at my expense. So that was that was that was happening because I stupidly I should have realized that everybody because I wasn't quick enough to get to the big end of the ladder. Um, so unfortunately, by the time I but I still thought, well, I've got a chance here of sneaking up on the field. But unfortunately, I was left sort of legs flailing, trying to, uh, to back out and go again. But anyway, I made the Queen laugh. Um, I mean, certainly sports days was a was a um, yeah, it was a very interesting experience at my prep school. That's hilarious because that's you kind of envision her in mom mode right there, which a lot of us, you know, didn't have the privilege of saying. So to see her, to feel the um, idea of her sitting there with all the other moms getting a kick out of watching her boys well, and their friends, that's such a great visual to have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, look, and I know she had a great sense of humor because my brother uh, trained for the Queen, uh, trained resources for the Queen. And uh, she, um, you know, had a great sense of humor and loved, loved a giggle. And, oh, well, that that uh, takes me into my next question. Is it true that your son was once jokingly called a lunatic by the late queen when the pair crossed paths at Royal Ascot in 2017? Uh, well, the, the story of that particular day is my brother, uh, I was trained the winner of the Ascot Gold Cup, my brother, Michael. Now, and I was commentating on talk sport on the race, which um, I got um, I got very emotional and <laughs> lost all sense of bias. Oh. And um, what happened was M- Ollie, my son, was doing the post uh, race interviews for ITV and charged down the track in a high excitement because it's his uncle's horse. And he wanted to go and congrat- congratulate James Dahl, the winning jockey and the staff who were looking after the horse. And he was judging Ireland with a wild, raging banshee. A few minutes earlier on Talk Sport, which I think is out there on the internet, uh, me commentating on Big Orange, I've gone ballistic. And um, and then it, well, it, 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 I think the Queen was reportedly said, well, who's that lunatic running down the course? So the next day, we did get to meet the Queen, me more by accident. Um, what happened was, uh, at the end of the day, she, I think she had a runner in one of the races. So she came down to the parade ring. And you don't walk up to the Queen, but the racing manager at the time said to Ollie, come over. And I had been doing something else. So I worked for Raska presenting their in-house TV and I was doing stuff for Talk Sport. I was called in. And then suddenly, uh, next minute, uh, John Warren says, come over. And now Ollie's talking to her. And then um, she says, Ludwig, and then what he... Then my son, cheeky little rat, he then said to the Queen, this is my father who did a commentary on Talk Sport, but spent the night sleeping in your car park. Because obviously I'd uh, because I'd had a bit of a party, but actually I hadn't been in the car park. I'd been staying in the chief executive of Ascot's house where yeah. I'd had a bit of a party. There's no two ways about it. But I he did put my foot in it. And it was lovely meeting her because she, having won the Gold Cup herself, yeah, it meant an awful lot to her. And when she used to have guests coming to Ascot, she would tell other people there, "That's the one I've won," you know, because she'd have a whole lot of them. But the Ascot Gold Cup for her, when she won it with Estimate in twenty thirteen, you you may have seen the pictures of her. Uh, yes, I love exc- that. And she was, you know, racing was right to the very end. I know she was talking to her trainers right to the very end but she absolutely loved it so she was sharing the family excitement of michael winning it with big orange me as the brother because i'd missed his wins in the derby in the oaks because i was covering something else for ollie to be there it was a very special family moment and obviously the 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 queen um you know enjoying it and and then she asked me she said said where did where 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 did this commentary go to which i said it was on talk sport mom and i a radio station I, I don't think you listen to. <laughs> so, but anyway, she laughed. So uh, anyway, she she was uh, 
uh, a much, much miss. And there was another story uh, that the Queen told against me, actually. Um, I fell over in the weighing room at Ascot and ended up with a great big gash in my, by, by eye. And there was a jockey called... Anyway, so I spent Royal Ascot presenting TV with a great big black eye. Oh, no. Which he's reportedly supposedly turned around to people watching while she was watching the Ascot big screen. She said, what's happened to the brother of my trainer? Has he been drinking? So anyway, there you go. So um, anyway, that. but so we we've had um, now yeah, uh, seeing the and it will be interesting. Royal Ascot will be interesting this year because obviously she couldn't turn up last year, um, and we saw. But it will be interesting. The king likes his racing. The queen Camilla, she definitely likes her racing. But will they come all five days? I think there will be a sort of element of mix and match about it because obviously the day always starts with that procession down the straight. So it may be that, you know, that one day it'll be that maybe King will do three days. Prince and Princess of Wales will do one and the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh or Princess Royal, who does love her racing, yeah. um, you know, because well, she's a brilliant equestrian rider, as is her daughter. Um, and it will be so it'll be interesting to know. But obviously, from a crowd's point of view, you know, they always want the main person. And the Queen just loved going racing. It was it was more than just a, an occasion because she loved what was going on at Ascot. She would have been involved in every detail she would want to know about and would almost like talk to the people at Ascot and she'd almost give them a mm, good idea or, or you give, you know, maybe you sure, you know, but that was actually her way of operating throughout that quiet, just sort of thinking, don't know, I agree with that. And then you'd think, then you go away and think about it. And if you, and that's the way she operated. So she was a very, it was that sort of subtle way of getting people to do what she thought was right, was very clever. In researching you, I did get the sense that th the loss of the queen was a huge loss to equestrian sports because she was so sincerely passionate about it. And I don't know, aside from Princess Royal or Zara, uh, if you know the, the king or if Prince William carry that passion as much as she had it. Well, quick. And Camilla definitely does. I know she does. And she's involved in horse charities, actually working with my son is involved with a thing called the Ebony Racing Club, which is in a, a suburb of London called Brixton, which is a pretty in places. It, it's got a lot of difficulties and uh, she's very involved. And I know she was at the British Racing School last week. She's very much she's always been it. She's a country woman at heart. And so mm -hmm. she but if no one's going to match the, the scale that the Queen um, operated on. And it wasn't just racehorses. It was across the, the horse breed. She would love Royal Windsor Horse Show. She'd be just as happy winning the Ascot Gold Cup or winning a class at the Royal Windsor Horse Show and picking up a £20 supermarket voucher. You know, so, you 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 know, it was everything. So she, But she knew everything. And, and that's why when you saw the funeral, the lovely picture uh, going down the straight of the, the pony and, and, and standing there bowing, but she... You know, horses were alive from a very small age, just riding around when it's a great part. They were, it was her happy place. And yeah. it was all things a question. And of course she was, you know, her daughter winning European uh, championship and an Olympian competed at the Montreal Olympics. You then Zara is a world champion uh, at her and loves her racing because she was at the Derby. So, but no, what, but Zara is in a sort of non-working Royal capacity and still competing, still wants to, uh, and is very competitive. Um, but no one is going to be, in, they won't be. And, and it's, it will be a different dynamic, but we'll still see the King's colours running. Um, but we won't see as many as we did with the Queen, who would have a, an extensive number of horses um, and breed them as well. So it will be a different dynamic, but um, the equestrian world, really benefited um, from her patronage, particularly the racing, because we, like I was at the Derby last weekend, the King's currently in Transylvania, yeah. um, in Romania, yet he didn't turn up at the Derby, um, whereas the Queen would would have been, I mean, she missed obviously the Platinum Jubilee one where it was going to be part of the celebrations. They still did stuff, but she missed the COVID one, but she would never normally miss the derby it would be in her diary i'm going to the you know I, that's what i want to do and 
she unfortunately never won the biggest slap race of them all in in this country. Well, you talked about kind of wishing, growing up, wondering why you weren't a Duke, being in this environment, having grown up in the in the environment around the Royals and in this time that the crown is set in. Um, when you watch Netflix is the crown. Is it totally off to you? Is the environment right? Uh, how do you feel when you watch that? Um, I'm going to tell a secret. I'm not interested in watching it. Okay, that's, that's fine. That's episode. totally fine. I haven't watched a single episode. My view is, it is, uh, I know what's gone on in it, yeah. right? And occasionally you see the odd clip, but I've never said, because actually, um, the problem with it now is, it's too real. There are too many people Agree. who know the real facts. It's a, it's faction, okay? It's Hollywood version of a, the royal family. And and I I think it's now getting slight. Now we're doing the crash scenes and everything, and I think mm. that's that's enough's enough. I think look, the, it was a very different era back in the fifties, and clearly, you know, not everything in the royal garden was rosy at the time. And I know, talking to my parents, the sort of gossip of the time. So when I see that and hear about the crime, I'm not surprised with the versions of events, and it's a variation on a theme. So you look at it, but actually what's sad is that it's most people's idea of that. Must, if it's in the crown, it must be true. Well, yep. take it with a pinch of salt. Yes. View it as entertainment. But yes, there are elements that stand that there is a sort of grain of truth. But obviously it's been given the Hollywood treatment and made drama to make good viewing. And those early series were supposed to be very good. Uh, it, it's beautifully done. I actually failed an audition for it, but that's another story. Oh, no, um, you got to tell me that. Uh, well, uh, it was to be a race commentator <sighs> uh, of a series in the 60s. So I turned up. I'd just done three three hours of tennis commentary, and I got a call. Would you like to come and do it? Well, Mike and Peter O'Sullivan was a very famous commentator, and he had this very languid style and coming into the street as X, Y, and Z. But actually, I did it like I do, and I go full, full Hot, deep, tonto, let's give it the full energy and overdid it. But actually, um, I, I I don't think I was quite right. But anyway, it's very amusing to go and do it. Yeah. Um, obviously, I do. But, you know, the 60s, like if you listen to American sports commentators, it'll have a very different rhythm and time. Um, so someone who was a full-time actor, presumably far more deserving of getting the part than me. So anyway, but it's just interesting to turn up. It was a... Uh, but uh, a failure uh, on my behalf. What a great uh, story, though. Was, great story. Thank goodness I was not a, a an actor because being rejected on a regular basis would have been heartbreaking. It's hard. We give you props, Meghan Markle. We give you props. Um, you mentioned your parents talking about gossip in the 50s. What's your first memory of the royal family? Uh, my first memory of the royals, uh, well, I suppose in terms of real memories, was obviously being at school with them and yeah. I, I mean I, I, I look and we knew it around my first tv memory was winston churchill's funeral oh. um in nine you know so i remember that and i'm watching it on a, a black and white television because that was a big state occasion but actually in real because of that um and going to school with you know andrew edward then there was the duke of kent's sons were there princess alexander so it was obviously they uh, all went to the same school. And I wasn't living in areas. So it was very convenient. Uh, the school doesn't exist anymore. Actually, it's now the uh, it's now something else. It's a school, but it's now called the Licensed Fitness School. Um, so that would be my first memory. And I remember TV cameras coming around because the royal family they shot some film there. And I also remember watching uh, the King's um, investiture uh, with everybody. Uh, of the at school of when he uh, for the Prince of Wales, right? Uh, I remember watching that on TV with all other members of the royal family watching, watching their brother getting getting uh, that moment. Um, and then I remember, so TV cameras, and I remember that um, being filmed, and the school features in it for a nanosecond. Yeah. Um, but I remember the camera crews coming round. So in a way, that's what I remember because I was suddenly in it. But it was. You know, we were just 
normal schoolboys there, naughty schoolboys. You know, um, it was it was a fairly b- basic school. Mm-hmm. Creature comforts were limited, I can assure you. But and anyway, what, hey, how that was of its time. Right. What What's the biggest misconception about the royal family? Is it that they are expensive? Is it that they are cold individuals? What do you think is the biggest misconception? Uh, that they don't care. Yeah. Sometimes. <clears throat> that they're, but they are actually very caring mm. in the main. I mean, I'm not saying... Unfortunately, um, you know, they, their arrogance has got um, in, in case in a couple of people. But in the main, they are very hardworking. They do their level best to and, and the king is very mindful and the expense is interesting. And that's why he's having to think about the optics of the royal family, because we are in a cost of living crisis. And, you know, in, and this country has got major sort of issues to deal with and if the royal family is seen as a cash cow for a f- for a few gilded people but actually it is very interesting where the monarchy in this country because as i say to any republican ne- what is better than this if you can if you can come up with a better solution i'm prepared to accept but do we want a f- another politician ending his days as our president or whatever it is as head of state, you're different. Your system is a presidential system. So right. he is the head of state, um, good or bad, right? Whichever, you know, whatever your um, persuasion. But the king is basically not really meant to do much. He's meant to basically be a figurehead as the head of state. So if you've got a better solution, then let me know what it is that doesn't involve feathering someone else's nest but but then you're only because if you're voting for it you've only got half the country probably approving of it so you immediately create a division absolutely i was just gonna say our system is so polarizing and you have this figure that unites the country no matter what day it is but it's so it's very important for that person to make sure and the king is mindful of, of it because he's 75 I, he can't put a foot wrong. He knows he's got to basically be seen to be the king of everyone, a united kingdom. And that is not easy. It is a fine line, particularly from a man who's got opinions and we know what they are. And then the environmental issues certainly can alienate. There are, would be other things that might alienate. And he's made the other odd, um, misstep, as they say, you know, the cash in the bag stuff and some of his people around him, you know, the, you know, the royal family can often have a lot of sycophants around working there because they get sort of sucked in mm. to the sort of, not power, but the the gilded lifestyle. And it's not easy, you know, if you're doing that day in, day out. You know, you think about it. Kate's trying to be a mother yeah. of three children, taking them to school. Yet the next minute she's probably got to, you know, she's spending a lot of time. OK, someone is, what are you wearing? I know it's sounds trivial but because we know there's going to be spotlight on anything she wears she's got to plan it be ready for it and put on a happy face if you try and do that every day um it ain't easy and that and not just her william's got to make sure that he doesn't do anything wrong and you know everyone wants to know what's going on his breakdown with harry and everything and he's under the spotlight but i do know for a fact that I'm an Aston Villa season ticket holder. Where he gets fun is his football. He will turn up at the training ground in Aston Villa and be like one of the lads. Oh, you know, I he love that. does try and give himself a downtime moment. But where it it comes to, you know, the, the monarchy is not an easy... Inst- you may be born into it, but you've somehow got to make sure you grow into it. And that one person who definitely has grown into it Sophie, Duchess of Edinburgh, has done an amazing job. But she, like Kate, comes from a non-royal background. So had working life, was in PR, made the odd mistake along the way. But right now, she's one of the go-to people. And Prince Edward, at one stage, wasn't much liked. But he, too, has found a way of just getting on with it. No fuss, no bother. And that's what the royal family have to be seen, is a no fuss, no bother organisation that is there on behalf of this country. 
what they don't like coming back to the original thing is people who think, right, I'm in it, but I don't really want to be in it because I don't really, I'm not sure it's me. And there are wider issues at play there. But I think the royal family currently is in good hands. The main objective for the king is to make sure that the monarchy is still fit for purpose for when his son takes over. And bearing in mind the king is 75, it's unlikely that he's going to be on for, you know, maybe well, it might, could be another 20 years. But then right. that means that William will be 60. So it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out. But the king, as you know, he, but the Prince of Wales will then take an increasing role as perhaps the king gets older and his health might start to suffer. Um, but at the moment, the king is determined to make sure that his first year and subsequent years, he leaves the institution in good shape, but in a modern shape. As it's progressed, if you look from 1066 right now, that coronation service had elements of all, but it evolved. And the monarchy has to continue to evolve to make sure that the people of this country feel it is of their value, because um, at the moment, there doesn't seem to be an alternative. I have one last question for you. Um, and you almost answered it just now. Uh, how do you think that William is handling his increase in responsibilities? Because we did see criticism that he wasn't working hard enough, but you are seeing a lot more of him in the Princess of Wales. Well, I think it's probably um, yes, but at the same time, he's got small children. He was doing other things as a uh, pilot, a uh, helicopter pilot and doing things. So he was having that family time. Um, which the Queen never had. She had mm. hoped to. That's why she went to Malta and things, but then suddenly was thrust into the spotlight with a small family, and then the times were very different. So I think now he's old enough, his children now are away at school. Oh, well, not away at school. They go to school. So um, in a way, it, he knows he has to step up to the plate. And, pe and he's... But it's because I think he's now 40. He's confident in his own skin now. Um, he's uh, of course it's a distraction what's going on with Harry but at the same time he is fully aware of his responsibilities and duty um, you know and hopefully uh, you know Kate and him the, they will continue to create the stardust the problem is with the demise of Will Meghan and Harry could have had it so good yes there's no two ways about it if they'd stuck it they would be getting all the love that they needed. OK, she wouldn't be getting the top job and she may not like her being a supporting actress, but she would have all the trimmings and you may have to suffer a bit, but you wouldn't be going through it. And would, a pair would probably be extremely popular wherever they went. And this is what is so sad, because Harry was a cheeky chappy loved by all. And it's sad that they felt and his insecurities led him to do this. Um, and his sense of, oh, probably or this trial is proving maybe sense of injustice that he was the spare. He couldn't cope with being the spare. But unfortunately, the nature of the beast is the oldest person. And now it can be a woman if it was a daughter. If if Charlotte had been first, she would have been queen next right. time round. If that's we we got rid of um, the old fashioned thing, so we're you know which is great, but. For Meghan and Harry, I still maybe Meghan is only fifth in line to the throne. You are a supporting actress, and maybe that's one of the things that she didn't like. And but the royal family, there is a protocol, and you have to adhere to it. Rupert, this is honestly, I, this I, where I think this is my fiftieth podcast. This is my favorite episode. You are so knowledgeable. I love all these inside stories you have. And this is absolutely by far the fa my favorite, favorite episode. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. This is my silly season. So oh, um, I gotcha. I got gotcha you right of... when I needed you. Well, I'm home for a day. So there we go. But lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much. And I look forward to your coverage on Talk TV. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Well,